Welcome to episode one, part two of the Quant Approach. I'm Quant number 112358, and now we're going to be talking about overclocking your PC. Let's start with understanding the basics, clocks, multipliers, and voltages. Here's a screenshot showing the MSI Command Center, voltages, temperatures, CPU Z, and Task Manager under a full load test. I will use these to explain how this is going to work. Every CPU has a base clock frequency, the front side bus speed. In the case of this i7 CPU, it's at 100 MHz. In fact, most Intel chips are at 100 MHz these days. The CPU then applies a clock multiplier, in this case of 35 to 37 times, which gives us our 3.5 GHz or 3.7 turbo. There's also the cache frequency, which is the same principle of bus times multiplier. In this case, normally, it's 30 for a cache frequency speed of 3 GHz. Then you have another multiplier between the front side bus and the memory. Remember that DDR stands for double data rate. So if you have RAM with specs of 2666 MHz, that means that you will run at 100 MHz front side bus times 20 multiplier, which gives you 2000 MHz, and you multiply that by a RAM divider of 2 thirds, and that gives you 1333 MHz. Double it, and you have your 2666 MHz DDR4 RAM. The RAM divider and multiplier can usually be set by XMP. When we overclock, we will raise the multipliers and clocks to run at the higher frequencies. But in order to support those higher frequencies, you need to increase the voltage, which improves stability, but also generates more heat. So make sure you have a good CPU cooler and good case cooling before overclocking. An overclock without enough voltage will simply be SOD, blue screen of death, and it will crash while running apps, or fail to post into BIOS even. Always make sure you understand the key features of your motherboard before you begin overclocking. Make sure you read the user manual, the overclocking manual, and do some research to find out what type of voltages people have used in the past. Take the time to learn where the clear CMOS button is. This little button will allow you to clear the BIOS settings back to default should you load something that doesn't want to post. So that covers how the clocks, multipliers, and frequencies work. Now let's get into the voltages. How do the voltages all fit together? Well, let's start with the CPU V-Core, since that's the main voltage to the CPU core itself. The default for these CPUs is around 1.00 volts. I suggest staying under 1.35 volts to increase the life of your CPU, especially on air and water cooling. These CPUs tend to throttle between 80 degrees Celsius and 90 degrees Celsius. Throttling scales back the CPU speed to save it from overheating. Now let's look at the CPU cache, or ring voltage. This is the voltage that is responsible for powering the cache. Increasing this helps with increasing the cache frequency. Cache frequency is sometimes referred to as the uncore in certain BIOSes. Its default is 1.05 volts. This voltage helps to also stabilize CPU core overclocks too. So if your V-core causes too much heat, try increasing the voltage to the CPU cache while dialing back the CPU V-core just a bit. You might be surprised at the gains you could find. The cache voltage can be increased to the same levels as the CPU V-Core, but I would try to stay under 1.3 volts on air. And again, especially on these new i7s, these Haswell E's, that depends if your motherboard has an OC socket. Mine doesn't have an OC socket, so I'm not going as high as other people will. Next there's the CPU system agent voltage. This is the voltage to the system agent, which is where the integrated DDR4 memory controller is. The default for this is a zero offset. This voltage helps a lot with memory overclocking on the CPU side. It all comes back to the CPU input voltage, CPU VCC in. This is the voltage that the motherboard provides to the CPU, and the CPU then takes this voltage and produces all other voltages to the CPU. The default for this voltage is 1.8 volts. However, increasing this voltage can help a little bit. I would stay under 2.1 on air cooling as increasing this voltage will definitely increase your temperatures and increase the difference between this and other voltages, which will increase the internal CPU temperatures. So here we go. You turn on the PC and hit the delete key repeatedly to enter BIOS. Here's the new Eufy BIOS. You can use your mouse to control things on the home screen like boot order sequence and you have six main menu choices. Settings, OC, M flash, OC profile, hardware monitor, and board explorer. Let's go into the settings menu. Within the system settings menu, you have your date, your time, your usual basic information about your SATA ports and the system itself. In the advanced menu, you'll find PCI subsystem settings, ACPI settings, integrated peripherals, USB configuration, power management setup, Windows 8 8.1 configuration if you're running Windows 8.1, and you also have some information about your Ethernet connections. 
In the boot menu, you will find the usual stuff that you're used to seeing, all of the usual boot options, and here's where you can select which device you would like to boot first. Security is very basic, just if you have an administrator password for the BIOS menu. And save and exit is where you're going to save your settings before you restart to load the settings. The OC menu is where you'll find all your overclocking settings. I've even disabled EIST and Intel Turbo Boost for a stock setting. You have your RAM configuration, where I've enabled XMP for my memory. You have all of your RAM voltages, your CPU voltages, and your memory configuration specifications. We'll come back to this menu in a few minutes when we get into actually using the overclocking settings. In the top left here, you have your OC Genie and XMP buttons, which tell you if you're using the OC Genie. Now let's look at some of these menus on the right, the OC Profile, the Hardware Monitor, and the Board Explorer. I'll just show you these very quickly. The Board Explorer allows you to look at all of the components of the motherboard with the mouse. You hold your mouse over each one and it gives you a little description of what's plugged in and what are the specs of that certain component. For example, it shows the Intel CPU, it shows the memory specs, it shows, um, it shows the debug LED, these are the manual voltage checkpoints on the motherboard itself, this is the crossfire switch, it'll even show you what's plugged into the USB ports. And that's pretty much it for the board explorer. Next I'll show you the hardware monitor. In this menu you can find things like the fan settings and temperature control settings. This allows you to control individually each case fan and CPU fan based on a certain temperature curve, meaning if your CPU or case reaches a certain temperature, it will apply a certain voltage to the fan and run at a certain RPM, as determined by this graph here. One nice thing about this system is that it does communicate effectively with the Corsair Link system, meaning you can control your all-in-one CPU cooler with this monitor. Now let's go back to the OC profile. In this OC profile, you're allowed to save and load different banks of BIOS settings. I also saved different settings during my overclocking testing, which allowed me to always go back to something I knew would work if I had loaded something that didn't work. Right now I have two main that I use, the stock and the overclock 4.4 3.5 setting. So let's load up the overclock setting and we'll explore what settings I used to accomplish a 4.4 GHz overclock. All you have to do is select the profile you want to load the settings for and it will apply those settings to the BIOS. So let's load this one, the 4.4 3.5 using 1.25 volts on the core with C states enabled and 2666 memory. So we'll apply this to the BIOS settings and then we'll go and take a look at which settings I used to achieve this overclock. Now that we're in the overclock menu, let's go through each item one by one. First, simple advanced mode. For overclocking, choose advanced mode. Extreme OC setup is disabled because extreme OC setup is used for liquid nitrogen cooling. Then on to the CPU settings. You're going to want to use the CPU ratio apply mode of all core. The CPU ratio we're going to run right now is 44 times, and the CPU ratio mode is fixed. If you have a ratio mode not fixed, EIST and Turbo Boost will move the ratio up and down depending on your use. The ring ratio we're using here is 35. We're going to run with a standard base clock of 100 MHz, and the apply mode we're going to leave it on auto. For the memory settings, because I have 2666 memory, I have enabled the XMP profile for 2666. In other cases, you may need to go in and adjust your CL timings to make your RAM work at these speeds. The XMP profile will take care of most of the settings most of the time. Now let's go into the power section, since this is what gives your overclock the stability it needs to run at the speed you desire. I've set a VCC in of 1.905 where stock was 1.808. I left the CPU core ring voltage mode to auto. I put the CPU core voltage up to 1.250 and I put the CPU ring voltage at 1.185. For the CPU system agent voltage, I'm running in an offset mode, so I just want to bump it up by about 0.05 volts. The rest of the settings are the memory voltage settings which are automatically set by the motherboard using the XMP profile. For me, these worked fine as is so I didn't touch them. I also didn't touch the PCH voltage, I left that on auto. And that's it, that covers the basic overclock settings to achieve 4.4 GHz core, 3.5 GHz cache, 2666 MHz memory, 
with C states enabled. Now I'm going to talk to you about C states. Basically C states are the processor levels of, sh of shutting down based on user usage. So if you're not using the computer, it allows the processor to save power. Sometimes if you're having difficulty achieving stability with your processor, start by disabling the C states. I'm running in C states C0, C1, and C2 for now. So I'll save changes and reboot and these settings will be applied and we'll boot into Windows and run some tests on this new overclock. Okay, so we're logged into Windows now and I've loaded up some footage from a GoPro Hero 4 Black Edition. Uh, I recorded this in 4K30, so very high bandwidth, uh, very high resolution, would normally require a lot of processing power. Um, but since we're running at 4.4 GHz overclocked, uh, it should be pretty quick for us. Uh, I've got the uh, Microsoft Task Manager here open on the right, along with the MSI Command Center, uh, so you can see the voltages and uh, temperature on the core. So let's let this run and uh, watch the load on the 12 logical CPUs climb up to 100. There we go, everything running at full steam. should have this video fully encoded in no time. And I'm going to stop it here because this was just for demonstration purposes. And that gives you an idea of some of the benefits of overclocking, especially with video encoding. Now let's look at some of these measured results that we have. I've run ADA64 and Intel Extreme Tuning uh, to benchmark this system. So I've done it on stock 3.5 GHz with 2400 memory, and I've done it with the overclock 4.4 GHz with DDR2666 memory. You can see here by this chart that we score higher on almost everything. Uh, some of the best gains are obviously on the CPU Queen score, um, along with the FPU Julia score. And here's a quick table that I put together so you can see the visual difference. Um, again, this table was put together using Windows 8.1. You can see that we were able to obtain a 900 megahertz overclock, which is a 26% increase. The difference being we've disabled turbo speed, the same base clock, we changed the multiplier. Uh, the V core went from 1.01 up to 1.25. The VCC in went from 1.8 volts to 1.888 volts. Uh, the VSA went from 0 to plus 0.05. C states, uh, stock at C6 all auto, and here we're C1E. The uncore cache speed, we're 3000 megahertz stock, up to 3500 megahertz now, and the V-ring cache was on auto before, and now we're at 1.85 volts. EIST is off in both cases. CPU ratio mode went from dynamic to fixed. We've increased the memory from 2400 to 2666 which forced us to relax our memory timings a little bit from 15, 15, 15, 35 down to 17, 17, 17, 39. The same DRAM voltage was used. Uh, so here's the temperature difference. Uh, we went from 32 on idle up to 40, uh, max load temperature of 60 to 67, and ambient room temperature in both cases was 28 degrees. Uh, we saw a 18% increase in Intel Extreme Tuning Marks, a 9% increase in memory read speed, 17% increase in memory write speed, 5% increase in memory copy speed. We saw a 6% improvement in latency. We also saw a 19% increase in CPU queen score and a 9% increase in PhotoWorks megapixels. On the rest of these metrics, we're seeing about 18, 19% increase across everything. So. What does this mean in summary? This means that for a 26% increase in core speed, we actually see about a 20%, 19%, 20% increase in performance. So how come a 26% increase in core speed doesn't result in a 26% increase in performance? Well, that's because the other points are lost due to heat. With all this extra heat, the energy has to go somewhere. And when the Windows 10 update came out, uh, I ran the exact same tests um, and I compared the Windows 8.1 overclock to the Windows 10 overclock. 
And this was just to satisfy my own curiosity that uh, Windows 10 would would not hurt any of the uh, overclock settings. Um, but you actually saw a minor improvement on uh, only two scores. So there you have it. Uh, Windows 10 didn't hurt. If anything, it helped just marginally. And uh, this concludes our review of building a new PC, selecting your parts, um, tuning the computer and getting everything up and running. And uh, I hope this was informative for all of you. This was fun to make. And uh, see you next time on The Quant Approach.